Hi folks, Dr. P here, and we're going to have a rather lengthy discussion of a fundamental question of warfare, what I call the two major strategic doctrines, for lack of a better word, and can your game allow both to be successful? There are two ways to conduct war, the direct method and the indirect method. The direct method tended to be used by the Romans typically by medievals and by 20th century Americans. Then there's the indirect method used by the English, the Athenians, the Byzantines, maybe Charlemagne. The, the direct or decisive method has two substyles. The first is smash mouth in your face. In pre-fire power, this means melee and short range where you can see the whites of their eyes. Analogous to, in American football, four yards in a cloud of dust. A team that rushes the ball constantly and just overwhelms the defense. This is the muscular style, to put it another way. And that was more common before the firepower era. And could be exemplified by this statement by Napoleon, God is on the side of the bigger battalions. Attrition wins out in this style. The second possibility for the direct method is the long range style, which in American football would be passing rather than rushing. In warfare, it's airstrikes and artillery rather than shooting in individuals. It's the firepower method as opposed to the muscular method. So here we see Napoleon as the king of artillery. He was trained as an artilleryman. Artillery inflicted a clear majority of casualties in World War II compared with other means. The indirect or incremental method is described in detail in at least three classic books. Sun Tzu's Art of War, B. H. Little Heart, The Strategy of Indirect Approach, and Edward N. Lutwak, The Grand Strategy of the Byzantine Empire. You attack the enemy where they are weak and avoid all-out battles. It can be called elegant or highly efficient or perhaps, if you want to be pejorative about it, nibbling. Don't inflash, let, fight unless you have to. Use stealth, deception, stratagems. What's a stratagem? Quote, a plan or scheme, especially one used to outwit an opponent or achieve an end, unquote. This is often favored by naval powers, again, such as Athens or England. Now I'm going to quote extensively from Sun Tzu, who says you want to do the unexpected. Quote, so in war, the way is to avoid what is strong and to strike at what is weak, unquote. Quote, all warfare is based on deception. Hence, when able to attack, we must seem unable. When using our forces, we must seem inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away. When far away, we must make him believe we are near." Unquote. Quote, to fight and conquer in all your battles is not supreme excellence. Supreme excellence consists in breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting. Unquote. All those from Sun Tzu. Charlemagne conquered much of Europe, but fought as few as two pitched big battles. Among other things, he had superior organization and logistics, but it was also a choice because everybody in medieval times knew that a big battle was a very chancy affair. The Byzantines went to the extreme, almost always preferring methods other than pitched battle. They were not favored by geography other than in Constantinople itself, which was a wonderful fortress. They had enemies on the Asian side, enemies on the European side, and there were constantly new enemies turning up. So from their point of view, there will always be more enemies, and today's enemy could be tomorrow's ally. All this takes time. The indirect approach is favored by those who have time on their side. Now I'm going to quote extensively from Edward Lutwak's summation of Byzantine grand strategy. 
Avoid war by every possible means in all possible circumstances, but always act as if it might start at any time. Gather intelligence on the enemy and his mentality and monitor his movements continuously. Campaign vigorously, both offensively and defensively, but attack mostly with small units. Emphasize patrolling, raiding, and skirmishing rather than all-out attacks. Replace the battle of attrition with the non-battle of maneuver. Strive to end wars successfully by recruiting allies to change the overall balance of power. Subversion is the best path to victory. When diplomacy and subversion are not enough and there must be fighting, it should be done with relational operational methods and tactics that circumvent the most pronounced enemy strengths and exploit enemy weaknesses. So that's Lutwek's summation. Now, this indirect method is not the same as guerrilla warfare or terrorism, but those forms both necessarily use the indirect method because they lack the strength to use direct methods. Though the French defeat at Dien Bien Phu in 1954 is an example of the Vietnamese going over to something more direct, even there they relied on blockading enemy supplies, not on a big fight that overwhelmed the French. Now, many people listening to this are from the USA and might wonder how the USA has done with this doctrine. In the 20th century, the US used the direct method. Today, both methods are employed by the USA. Usually, when you have more stuff, and often better stuff, more ammo, more supplies, more of everything, <clears throat> the direct method works well enough, though it may incur lots of casualties. But, if you have enough stuff, you can substitute using up stuff for losing men, which is what we try to do nowadays. Automation can also substitute for men as in offensive drones nowadays. How about a simple if and probably simplistic summation? You can see this as battle versus maneuver, but it's not only that. In other ways, you can see it as attrition versus nibbling, incremental successes. The direct are willing to trade man for man, indirect or not. The question for designers is, can your game allow success with either? Now I'm clearly in the maneuver or indirect camp, so my games tend to be games of maneuver. What about typical wars? How does this work? In the common forms of war, you first have military superiority versus economic superiority as at the start of World War II. The economically superior want to wage indirect war, at least until they gain the majority in strength. The military side, those who are superior in military, are in a hurry to win before the economic superiority tells, and they tend to use direct methods. The other common form is superiority in two different spheres of military capability. For example, land superiority versus sea superiority. So we hear we have classic confrontations such as Sparta versus Athens, England versus France in the time of Louis XIV, Louis XV, and Napoleon. The sea side wages indirect war. The land side wants to get their opponents into a direct war. What about some examples from classic war games? In grand strategy, the game diplomacy can be played either way. You can plan well ahead and try to have solid alliances, or you can backstab and lie your way through things. And the latter tends to be the indirect method, the Byzantine method. We christen things Byzantine when there are lots of variations, uh, subterfuge, and so forth, which is what the Byzantines used. In its tactics of the game diplomacy, the ordering and the fighting of the units, it's a game of maneuver because there is no chance involved in combat, but it tends to be larger force crushes smaller force. So here's a case where maneuver is not the same as indirect method. 
risk is pretty direct in all its aspects, partly because the attacker has the advantage in battles where there are even numbers, because the way the combat is organized in the American version of the game. Axis and Allies is heavily attrition based, yet there's scope for some indirect approaches, though not on the Eastern Front. Battles are emphasized in Axis and Allies. The defender can't even retreat. How can you use indirect methods when you can't even get out of the way? Now, some historical situations may not admit one method or, or the other. For example, the Franco-Prussian War is a pretty straightforward direct, but many others do. It depends on the situation. Thanks for listening.